Okay. All right. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's colloquium speaker, uh, Dr. Hari Lail from Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Um, I've had the pleasure of not only getting to know Hari over the past couple of years, but learning a lot about laser-induced uh, spectroscopy of plasmas from him over uh, some collaborations. And so um, it's great to have him here today uh, to talk about some of his work. He is a chief scientist at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Uh, he's been with PNNL since 2014. And before that, he was a faculty member at Purdue University. And before that, he was a research scientist at the University of California uh, in San Diego. And one of his primary responsibilities at PNNL is uh, developing laser-based standoff detection tools for national security applications, uh, among other things. He's uh, peer-reviewed over, he has over 175 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters on topics from optical spectroscopy of laser plasmas, plasma diagnostics, UV lithography, and applications of plasmas, and so forth. And as of about 36 hours ago, amongst his other awards, he's a newly elected OSA fellow, uh, and he just found out. And the citation is for pioneering contributions to the fundamentals of laser ablation, optical spectroscopy of laser ablation plumes, and laser plasma light sources. And so he's here today to tell us some of his work on optical spectroscopy of laser-induced plasmas. So thanks. Thank you, Andres. You can hear me, right? Ah, okay. The title of my talk is Optical Spectroscopy of Laser Breeze Plasmas. So for my first slide is, you know, I'm just uh, going through acknowledgement. So usually I had to do. Sometimes I put it in the last. Uh, these are my uh, PNNL folks, uh, mostly scientists here. Kyle and Nicole's my postdocs. Uh, these three are my undergraduate students. Usually I encourage students to come over during summertime. Uh, I will show one slide in the end. What are the opportunities there at PNNL for the graduate and undergraduate students? Uh, then uh, I have been I am collaborating with Jason for some time. Uh, Jeremy, he is here. Probably we started collaboration around 2009, 2010 time frame. Then some other folks, including Igor Jovanovic at the uh, University of Michigan, and is funded by pretty much NA22 funding. So this is the outline of my talk. Uh, basically, I will go through the fundamentals of laser ablation in the first few slides. I may introduce your field. I don't know how many of you are familiar with this field, and including the optical spectroscopy, basics from emission and absorption. Uh, we are trying to develop standoff isotope measuring tools. So that means we need to generate plasma at a certain distance. So I will discuss about the different plasma generation techniques. And uh, some physics about the laser pre plasma, especially on the factors affecting the laser physics, molecular formation. And in the second part, I will discuss on the optical spectroscopy of standoff isotopic analysis. This is the area I'm working currently a lot. So most, most of you are familiar with the lasers, so, but the laser ablation, laser ablation is a simple process. You need to focus a high energy pulse on a material, many, any sample. So you may generate a plasma. In the case of solids, usually it's called a laser ablation. You're ablating, right? You're dumping the energy. A lot of material is coming out, it's ablation. So you can see this photograph. This is the typical, you know, if you take a photograph, you will see it. This, this, this photo came from my PhD thesis, in fact. Still, I'm using it. <laughs> and you can see this is the ablation event recorded at different times. The time is given here. Uh, you can feel that, you know, how transient this phenomena is. Changed. All physical properties are changing with its space and time. Uh, so it's a plasma, it's a heated gas. The properties are changing with the space and time. And emission is I mean, entire region of electromagnetic radiation because depending on the temperature of the plasma. So for example, if you heat the plasma to 1 EV, one EV or 10,000 Kelvin, uh, you may get visible radiation. Instead, if you heat it to 100 EV, you may get a soft X-rays or you know, hard X-rays. So we can get a, any kind of source from uh, laser-produced plasma, so depending on the intensity of the laser you are using. The other important aspect is that you can use the entire element in the periodic table. It doesn't matter whether you are using gas or, you know, what kind of material, you can ablate it. This slide gives some of the applications. Probably 
you may have some idea about the Mars Curiosity. It has got a LIPS instrument. And uh, it's doing standoff detection or remote detection. Some people tell that oh, it's, it's not basically the standoff distance is only seven meter there. It's not like a you know pump. We are sending the laser from here to there and getting the light back. No, this is much simpler compared to what we are dealing with for the isotopic analysis. And this is system is basically for the elemental analysis. So some of the applications are given here. The first one is the light sources. So LS Space Plasma is a good source for, I already mentioned, you can generate the light source for the entire range of electromagnetic radiation, whether it is X-rays or EUV or visible or higher. I worked on this EUV lithography, uh, especially for developing the 13.5 nanometer source for a long time. I also worked on the soft X-ray, especially called water window. Water window, the name implies that in this region, the absorption by water is less. So that means we can use that radiation for imaging purposes. There are a lot of applications there. We can also develop a broadband sources using laser produced plasma. Then the analytic applications, and right now I'm working in this area right now. So I will go through it quickly later. There are some other applications like nanoparticle synthesis, surface monitoring, micromachining, and so on. And it's growing right now. If you talk about the laser ablation, it's not new. If you look at the literature, you can find uh, the first paper appeared in 1962. You know, the first laser, ruby laser, came out like in 1961. So it has, a, it has got a history of almost like a 60 years. However, still I could say the physics of laser ablation is immature. The main reason is that you can see that how much physics involved here. So this is a schematic of the nanosecond laser ablation with a solid target. So you can go through the steps during the laser. You know, initially the photons are interacting with the atoms or electrons. Then it's excited. Once you excited it, you know, basically it will go through uh, temperature rise. Once the temperature is really high, then you have phase explosion. Then a uh, material is going to be, you know, changed from solid to liquid or to vapor. Okay. And once the plasma is formed, the next interaction is the interaction between the laser and the plasma. So there should be heating. And then at the end of the laser pulse, the second phase is started. If you have an ambient gas, then uh, the plasma is interacting violently with the ambient gas. Then you may have shockers and all kinds of phenomena. In fact, we can use this laser plasma as a surrogate, like a, or as a situation like a nuclear explosion, right? We are dumping a lot of energy, and everything is coming out with a high temperature and density. So some of the questions are listed here. Still, we don't know. What is the early time dynamics, prompt electron generation, Coulomb explosion? That means there are a lot of questions in this region. There are a lot of need for fundamental research. So this slide shows the uh, temperature, of the laser, temperature of a laser-produced plasma. In this case, uh, we use the 55 millijoule, very low energy, eight nanosecond pulses, and uh, focused on a uh, air. So you can hear big sound whenever you focus it because of the acoustic is coming out from here. And in the early time, you can also see the shockers. Let me wait. Yeah, these are the shockers. Initially, it's propagating. Then it's, de then it's decoupling the from the plasma around one microsecond. At a later time, you will see a lot of turbulent formation. And if you measure the temperature, you can see the initial temperature will go up to 70,000 Kelvin. So you can feel that, how hot it is. So we will basically kick out electrons from nitrogen and oxygen, all elements in the atmospheric air. So it's really hot plasma. And density, density is it can go up to nearly 10 to the 19 per centimeter cube. Now let me talk about the optical spectroscopy. Our spectroscopic method. Basically, we need to collect the light and uh, analyze it. Yes, yes. I think I have one slide to show that one. Uh, so this is basically, uh, this slide gives the fundamentals of uh, uh, optical spectroscopy. All of you know uh, optical spectroscopy is a science that's dealing with the interaction of light with the ma matter, right? And atoms are the basically the fundamental unit of the uh, all matters. If you take any atoms, there are electrons, and electrons basically it will jump between the uh, different electronic levels. And if you excite uh, any atoms in the ground level, it will go up. That process is called absorption, and uh, the reverse process, because it will come the atoms, the excited atoms will come come to the ground. That's called uh, uh, emission. 
So since there's a, there's a, 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 a absorption or emission is happening between two discrete levels, you always see a spectrum with a finite structure. So this is the typical copper plasma. You can see very, very fine structure here. Very narrow, narrow radiation. Here. So if you're, instead of taking atomic absorption, atomic atoms, if you're considering molecules, what's going to happen? So molecules are typically bonded together with the chemical bonds, right? So that means they have more degrees of freedom like a vibration and rotations. So these are the electronic uh, energy level diagram of a diatomic molecule. That's the simplest case. You can see the, yeah, you know, basically the electronic transition that's between the, the bottom level of here. And then in each electronic level, you have the vibration levels. And each vibration level, you have the rotation levels. Because of that reason, molecular spectra is always rich. You can see that these are the, the narrow lines here represents the vibration transitions. Then, in every vibration transition, there are rotation transitions. That you can see it here, very fine structure. So more, compared to atomic spectra, molecular spectra is always like a very rich. So what are the optical spectroscopy tools we can use? There are, probably I can tell there are three. One is called a laser ablation and optical emission spectroscopy. Basically, we are collecting the light and analyzing it. And the second category is laser ablation, laser absorption spectroscopy. And third one is laser fluorescence spectroscopy. Let me walk through uh, these three more in more details. In optical emission spectroscopy, commonly it's called a laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy, or LIPS. Well, most of you care about, some of you care about this uh, technique. Here what we are doing is, you know, we are collecting the light using some appropriate optics and uh, send it to a spectrograph. The spectrograph, it has got a dispersion elements and eventually is analyzed using an intensified CCD camera. And you can see, you can get the spectrum light, something like this. The pros of this technique, the merits are, it's a symbol. We need to analyze the, you know, light and we'll get a liminal information. It's a passive observation. Passive observation means you are not disturbing the plasma. You just collect the light and analyze it. Broadband detection, because, you know, typically with the moderate resolution spectrographs, we can get a very large bandwidth, like a 200 nanometer. Uh, Multi-element, because of the broadband capability. It's in situ or rapid. And the most importantly is the stand of capability because if you fire the laser to some, some source, we can generate a plasma, collect the light, and analyze it. So it, it, comes, it comes with a stand of cap capability. But the cons are thermal excitation. Thermal excitation means you need to excite the atoms from the ground to the excited level. So it's, it's more like electronic excitation. So we need high temperature environment. That's the one cons. Then the speckle warning. Because typically emission is happening when the temperature and densities are higher because it's a collisional process. So that means spectral bonding is going to be a problem. Spectral resolution. Even if, if you wait until later times of plasma evolution, still the instrumental bonding, that will create big issues. Because even if, if you are using a one meter spectral graph, that's the biggest we can get it from the vendor. The maximum resolution we can get it probably like a, uh, 20 picometer, 25 picometer range. And uh, I'm talking about the isotope splitting. Typically, it's like less than 10 picometer. So this is going to be a problem. And low sensitivity. Low sensitivity means still we can get a parts per million. But if we compare with the mass spectroscopic tools, usually we are talking about parts per billion or parts per trillion. So typically, the lips, because of that reason, you know, it's not good for identifying the trace elements. This slide gives the laser absorption spectroscopy. Again, you can see the schematic here. You know, we need, to, we need a tunable laser, a second laser, excite the downstream population to higher, and then record the transmitted intensity or absorbed intensity. So this transmitted intensity can be converted into absorbance using this equation. This is basically lower than how much, transmission, how much intensity is transmitted. Then you may get this profile. This is the laser induced uh, absorption spectroscopy. The pros are active integration. Uh, we are basically looking at the ground state population instead of uh, excited state population in the case of emission spectroscopy. That means we can probe the plasma when the plasma is cooler. That's a big advantage. Then the spectral lines are not going to be broadened. So because of that reason, you know, 
we may get the narrow spectral line width. And it also comes with a high sensitivity. Usually the sensitivity of laser absorption spectroscopy is, I could say, more than an order better than uh, emission spectroscopy. The cons, it's or, mean orthogonal pro, uh, beam configuration. You can see that you have to pass the be, or, you know, beam orthogonal to the plasma expansion direction. That means it lacks standard capability. Then the third category is the laser-induced fluorescence. It's, a, it's more or less similar to uh, laser, laser absorption spectroscopy. The only difference is that, you know, instead of, instead of recording the transmitted intensity, we are looking at the emission caused by the absorption. Okay? So here you can see that, you know, basically we are exciting the plasma using a second laser, and then collect the uh, radiation and uh, basically analyzing using a spectrograph. We don't need a spectrograph. We can use a photodiode in this case. And then we may get the excitation wavelength. Advantages, active integration. We are looking at the ground, ground state, narrow spectral line width, high resolution, and the stand of capability. In fact, the lift basically brings the merits of thermal, uh, you know, emission spectroscopy and absorption spectroscopy. There are two types of transmission in the case of LIF. One is resonance. In this case, we are basically looking at the LIF caused by the resonance excitation at the same wavelength. And the second category is that if you are if you're looking at an atomic system, uh, the same excited level is coupled to different transition, right? Different lower levels. So if we can use the non-resonant LIF uh, for standoff application, it's good because then we can avoid the scattering issues. So how can we generate the plasmas? There are, you know, we can use what will be the laser available in the market, right? It has to be powerful. And we need intensities like a 10 to the 8 watts per centimeter squared for ablation, right? And typically, most of the groups, they are using nanosecond because it's readily available. It's cheap. Uh, then recently, people started using femtosecond laser ablation. Uh, there are certain advantages I can show in the next slide. Then we can also use the filament. Because the advantage of using filament is that we can propagate the filament to very large distances without diffraction. Uh, I will come to this point one by one. This slide shows the physics of physics that comparing the nanosecond laser ablation and femtosecond laser ablation. And uh, those figures look same, but uh, the physics is different. Okay, it's starting with the ablation. In the case of nanosecond ablation, as I already mentioned, it's a therm thermal process, right? In the case of femtosecond, it's not thermal. It's mostly non-thermal. This is just because in the case of nanosecond, the relaxation times, that's electron ion relaxation ion or heat conduction time, is they are significantly smaller than the pulse width of the laser. And in the case of femtosecond, it's just the opposite. Because of that reason, the ablation process is going to be different. But at the later stage, you can see the similar kind of phenomena, but the time scales are going to be different. <laughs> Because of that reason, there are a lot of difference between the plasmas generated using nanosecond and femtosecond that is briefly summarized in the slides. In the first slide, it's showing the emission, emission features obtained using the femtosecond laser ablation here in the first row. And uh, this is from the nanosecond. Again, for comparison, we use the same fluence levels, okay? Uh, if you are asking, like, uh, then the intensity will be different. Of course, we need to keep some parameters same, okay? So here you can see that the spectral features are very clean. You know, mostly it contains the atomic radiation. And the continuum radiation, that is basically because of the heating, that's negligible here. You can see significant continuum in the case of nanosecond. And the additional lines, whatever be the additional lines you see, that's due to ionic emission. That's absent here. That's uh, one positive with the femtosecond laser. The second positive thing is that we can get a cleaner ablation because in the case of femtosecond ablation, you are basically depositing all energy instantaneously. Because of that reason, the heat of exoson is going to be very much reduced. So the ablation is more like a phase transformation is from solid to vapor. So you can get a cleaner just here. And in the case of nanosecond, basically, you know, we are dumping all the energy, and they basically it's moving from solid to liquid, then to vapor, right? So you have to expect a lot of resolidification and molten kind of pool here. So it's, it looks really ugly. I mean, if you are looking at the crater of the nanosecond laser ablation. Uh, 
And you can also see a significant difference in hydrodynamics. It's very collimated in the case of femtosecond compared to nanosecond. Ablation efficiency is also higher because there is no laser plasma coupling or loss in the case of uh, femtosecond laser ablation. And the temperature is also lower in the case of femtosecond laser ablation. The third kind of uh, ablation mechanism is that we can use the filaments. So you are in the optics school, so most of you are familiar with the filaments. So filaments are formed because of the interplay between the dynamic interplay between the curlands. That is a self focus and it's basically generating a, a positive refractive index. Then eventually the intensity is really high, you may generate a plasma. So it has got a negative refractive index. So then we can get a collimator laser beam and we can propagate this laser beam to kilometers. So people show, you know, filaments are propagated to tens of kilometers in the past. But our question is, can we able to generate good plasma using that filaments? That's not possible with the, by propagating it to 10, 10 kilometers, okay? But however, for short distances like at hundreds of meters, probably is possible. That's the stuff we are investigating right now. So this is the, uh, some kind of, you know, parallel cut of filaments. Usually the filament diameter is like a 60 to 100, uh, 100 microns, and it has got intensities like a 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 14 watts per centimeter squared. That's good enough for, you know, ablating any material. However, most of the energy is dumped on the energy reservoir. So that's basically affecting the energy coupling between the filament plasma, sorry, filaments and the material or solid target. So we investigated a lot about the, can we able to use the filaments or the, you know, for standoff analysis? This is one of the experiments we carried out. We can generate the filaments using different methods. One is simply propagating the filaments a laser to a large distance. It will self collapse, but we had to propagate like a tens or probably like a 20 or 50 meters to get the good filaments. So instead we forced the laser to co collapse by using a long focal lens, lens. In this case we used a four meter lens. And uh, look at the plasma properties along the filamentation channel here. So what we did, we positioned the target at different distances here and uh, evaluate the plasma properties. And uh, these are the spectrum recorded at different distances from here. Okay, from lens, I could say. Yeah, from lens. The first thing we noticed is that we expected that the intensities of the plasma lines, or the emission from the plasma lines is going to be more or less constant along the filamentation channel. However, that's not true. You can see significant variation here. So what's the reason behind it? The intensity of any radiation according to spectroscopy, you know, it's related to the number density of the atoms available as well as the temperature. So we looked at the plasma properties using by assuming the plasma is in LTE, that is a local thermal equilibrium. And we got res this results. We noticed that temperature is more or less constant along that filament channel. Then why the, int why the intensity of the line radiation is changing? That could be due to the ablation efficiency. So we looked at the number density of the electrons there. And it's changing drastically along the filamentation channel. And that's also confirmed by looking at the ablation uh, crater. So if it is simply caused by the filaments, the ablation, then uh, the crater size should be 60 to 100 micrometer, right? So that's the standard size of the filaments. Instead, we, can, we notice that the crater size is almost like, a, almost like a 300, 400 microns. So that implies, apart from the filaments, the energy reservoir around the filament is also contributing the ablation mechanisms. So that, so that, that means it's very important for selecting the point along the filamentation cha channel for getting the best ablation conditions. We also compared the different, the plasmas created by different filament, uh, filament generation conditions. The so one reason is that, you know, most of the people, they create the filaments in the lab using, by forcing the laser to, uh, using a long focal length. And then mentioned that, oh, we can generate this kind of strong plasma. Is it true? So what we did, we generate the filaments by loosely focusing using a four, four meter lens. Also, we propagate the beam to very high distances. In this case, we propagate approximately 17 meter. At that distance, by adjusting the chip of the laser, we can, we can get good filaments, okay. We compare the plasma properties, and we notice that filament plasmas are very weak. Here, I also include the, you know, 
sharply focused onto second layers, in this case we use a 10 centimeter lens and focus it directly. So that means we can get a really hot and dense plasma. So you can see that even with a sharply fo loosely focused filaments, in this case, the temperature as well as densities are really weak. So and also the persistence of the plasma is also really weak. And if you compare these two, uh, loosely focused filaments and lensless uh, filament, the persistence is really poor. So there, this is a big question of using, you know, filaments for stand of detection. You know, we need to overcome these issues. So apart from the uh, laser parameters like, you know, pulse width or intensity, the other factors affecting the plasma is the environment. So, for example, if we generate a plasma in vacuum, what's going to happen? It will expand freely, right? Instead, if you are generating a plasma in an ambient gas like air, there are a lot of things, you know. Uh, some of them are listed here. So, for example, you can see that this is the this is a plasma created a really good vacuum, 10 to the minus pi tau. Or I could say vacuum just because the mean free path of the ambient ambient particles are really hard, really large compared to you know plasma mean free path. Okay, or the ballet. Uh, so you can see that the plasma is expanding. These are the, this, the, these are the three columns represent the plasma rec recorded at different times. This is at 100 nanosecond, 400 nanosecond, one microsecond. At a lower pressure or vacuum conditions, plume is expanding freely. With increasing pressure, somewhere around uh, 100 millitor, you can see the plasma becomes more, colli uh, more collisional. In this case, the ambient gas basically started collision, uh, you know, colliding with the plasma species and re-exciting. Then you can see a lot of emission here. And if it, again, if you increase the pressure, then the ambient gas acting like a more like a, you know, force. So it will basically constrain the expansion. That you can see it here. And eventually, at atmospheric pressure levels, the size of the plasma is going to be confined to a few millimeters. So typically, you know, we can use different gases. Uh, you know, if we use the inert gas, there are certain advantages like uh, argon or helium because then we are avoiding the plasma chemistry. However, if you, for standoff experiment, we had to do all experiments in air, right? Ex air means it contains oxygen and nitrogen. It can react with the plasma species. So it will create a lot of plasma chemistry there. And also it will lead to a molecular formation. So we extensively studied the effect of the uh, oxygen uh, on the lips, but what, what's happening if you have an oxygen, oxygen is present there? It's again related to the standard applications for the lips. So this uh, movie, it shows the plume expansion in the presence of one atmosphere pressure. So this is almost mimicking like a nuclear explosion. You can feel that, right? So the shockers are propagating there, or, you know, the, the, there are secondary shocks. You can see that. And the material is ejected at a later time. At early time, it's darkened just because the number density, I mean, the, it's a high density region. You know, the laser is becoming opaque there, okay? Uh, this is the CFD simulation. So you can feel the, you know, the strength of the shocks that's coming out from my laser-produced plasma from this, uh, from this movies. We also looked at the, the role of air on the plasma chemistry. In this case, what we did, we generated an aluminum plasma and allowed to expand in the air, okay? So aluminum, all, all of you know, if you have oxygen around, it will interact and generate aluminum oxide. We looked at the, the molecular formation in, a, uh, in, in the expansion during the aluminum in the presence of air. So these are the spectral features collected at different times uh, during the aluminum plasma expansion. So you can see that at early time, as expected, the temperature is really high, so you may, get, you may see broadband emission. As time evolves, the temperature is coming down, you, you might see more like a atomic radiation, like a, these are aluminum atoms and aluminum ions. As time goes, at a, somewhere around very late time, you may see uh, molecules. So the question is that why the molecular emission is delayed. So this is the spectral features, you know, recorded with the similar condition. The only difference is that this is a low resolution spectrum. If you if you are using a high resolution, then you will see all the rotational and vibration bands like this. So you investigate what's the reason why molecular emission is happening at a very late time. So we know we what we did, 
We specifically looked at the aluminum oxide emission from the plasma. And uh, th these images correspond to yellow emission. And you can see that this, these two, you know, bars, these are artifacts because of the continuous emission in the early time. And the rest, these are the aluminum oxide emission. And we notice that the aluminum oxide is, you know, forming at a later time and it's expanding. And we correlated with this, this with the modeling of the shock wave expansion. Our results showed that, modeling results showed that shock waves will collapse somewhere around 25 to 30 microseconds. It indicates the shock waves are mediating the aluminum oxide or molecular formation in laser produced plasma. So this is the schematic we prepared. You can see that at early time the shocks are expanding and it's protecting or it's acting like a barrier for any kind of molecular formation. At a later time, the shock waves are collapsing, then uh, all the oxygen atoms or molecules will interact with aluminum species in the plasma. So this appeared as a cover page recently in analytic chemistry in this work. Okay, so second part. Uh, standard isotopic analysis. So the first question is, what is the purpose, okay? Uh, Currently, the isotopic analysis is pretty much done with the mass spectroscopic tools. So mass spectroscopy means there are several tools like a SIMS. SIMS is secondary ionization mass spectrometer. TIMS is thermal ionization mass spectrometer. Then the ICPM is interactively coupled plasma mass spectrometry. Okay. Uh, if you, I don't know, you have any experience with the mass spectrometer, usually it's a big instrument with a big vacuum chambers and everything. And if you want to get uh, isotopic information, you need to send the sample to the lab. They will basically do a lot of sample preparation. And typical time for getting uh, isotopic information from a sample, if you send it to the lab, like it's four to five days using teams of SIMS. So what's missing? Standoff, infill, rapid, and non-contact. No sample preparation techniques. So this is the area we are considering. We, we propose that optical spectroscopy with the laser ablation sampling is the way to go. Okay, this is a schematic. So we need to fire a laser, generate a plasma, and if we can analyze and get the isotopic information, that will be cool. So what are the challenges? You know, optical spectroscopy is very easy to do it, but there are a lot of challenges. The biggest challenge is that the isotopic splitting. If you have U238 and U235, the, the line radiation is going to be shifted by very small quantity. The average isotopic splitting for uranium is 7 picometer. What's the physical mechanism for that Yeah, it's, it's in this case what's happening is that the number of neutrons are different. So the electron interaction with the nuclear, that will change. That's change, even though the change is going to be very small. Right, exactly, exactly. Exactly. So some element like lighter element is very easy because the, you know, the interaction, because of interaction, the splitting is going to be really high. For example, if you take hydrogen and deuterium. But we are interested in uranium. So the average is isotopic shift is only 7 picometer. The second problem is that, you know, we are generating a gaseous phase using the laser. So it's a high density, high temperature region. You have all kinds of spectral bonding like a stock. Uh, pressure bond like a wonder world, then Doppler is there. If you use emission spectroscopy, your spectral resolution is limited because of the instrumentation broad. If you are using a 0.5 meter spectrograph with a 2400 gating, the maximum resolution we can get is around uh, 40 picometer. And average isotopic splitting is around uh, uh, 7 picometer. So the solution, laser absorption spectroscopy, because it's high, highly sensitive, uh, it provides the uh, highest resolution, but still challenges. Orthogonal problem uh, configuration, we will not be able to use it for the standoff analysis. So we suggested that if you use LIF, basically it comes with this, basically combining the merits of the emission as well as the absorption, that's the way to go. However, there are a lot of challenges, you know. Dealing with the uranium is not very easy. So if you look at the uranium spectrum, it's so crowded. So this is the uh, spectral emission features we collected from uranium metal. Uh, you can see how crowded it is. Uh, based on the literature, we noticed that, you know, in the visible region itself, there are 100,000 lines of uranium. So they are very closely packed. 
Okay, that's coming from 1600 energy levels. So analysis of uranium is analysis and modeling. They are very challenging. We are also interested in you know, uh, uranium oxide formation because you know all of uh, some of you might, might be knowing is uh, uranium is uh, pyrophoric. That means if you have oxygen around, it basically it, it's going to be oxidized really fast. So that means if you can track the uh, oxygen, uh, if you can track the molecules, that is al also another signature. The other reason for investigating this one is that if we have oxidation, basically it's quenching the lifetime of the uranium atomic radiation. So we need to know where the uranium is go that, where it's going, right? Uh, we looked in the uranium oxides in the uranium plasma. Uh, we noticed that there is a strong band around uh, 593.7 nanometer. And we haven't seen any rotational transition because it's a, it's everything is kind of you know clogged there because we can see a big background there. We believe that is due to rotational transitions. And still, we are trying to understand the plasma chemistry. Uh, that means the uranium oxide formation. This is a grave area. There are a lot of work going on in this area. Uh, we are not the first, uh, you know, trying to solve this problem, you know. In fact, uh, people use emission spectroscopy for analyzing uh, isotopic information from the uranium. This is a uh, Clemens did it way back in 2000 tall. They used their spectrograph with the resolution 70,000, 70,000. I think they used the Catalina scientific uh, uh, spectrograph. And they were able to separate the isotopic splitting of 25 picometer. This is the highest uh, isotopic splitting available with the uranium transition. And we believe that absorption is the way, way to go. And this slide shows the, you know, the resolution available with the uh, laser absorption spectroscopy. Here we resolve two cross bay transition. They are separated by 20 picometer, and you can see that, you know, how much. We can easily easily get isotropic splitting with even with a uh, few picometer uh, separation. So this is the, the two transition we studied. That's a uh, aluminum one uh, and uranium one. You can see that, and uh, the, the transition at the wavelength is given here. So this this implies that if you are using absorption techniques, it comes with a high precision as well as high resolution. So this is the experiment we recently performed using uranium metal. Uh, it's again natural uranium. Natural uranium contains approximately 99.3% U-238 and 0.7% uh, U-235. And these are the time resolved uh, absorption spectroscopy measurements. You can see both pieces you can identify, but we need time resolution. So it's, a, it's always a, some ch challenges are there. In the absorption spectroscopy, you know, it comes, it's basically providing the high resolution and the sensitivity. However, we can get only one transition, right? It's a narrowband detection with a, that's a limitation. We can overcome this limitation if we are using frequency comps. So this is the experiment by, you know, uh, Professor Jason Jones. Uh, in this case, you know, we, we have the frequency comps, you know, spectral bandwidth is around the 14, 14, uh, peak, 14, Nanometer, yeah, 40 nanometer or 7 terahertz. And then we can get uh, absorption features at a large bandwidth. So basically, dual com uh, frequency cons basically brings in a resolution spectral bandwidth. This, this is an excellent result. So this is uh, basically, if you use dual com frequency cons, we can overcome this limitation. Now, the rest is uh, the rest of my talk is focusing on the laser induced fluorescence. Now, recent work, okay. So again, going back to laser induced fluorescence, you know, we are exciting. Uh, the plasma using similar to uh, you know laser absorption spectroscopy. Instead of looking at the absorption, we are looking at the emission. We analyze using a spectrograph, and then we can get the uh, excitation wavelength. The transition we probe, we, we look at the aluminum as well as uranium. In both cases, we always look for the non-resonant layer. That means we are using a one transition for pumping and the other transition for life emission. It's coupled to the same upper level. This is the transition we selected for aluminum, and this one is for uranium. Here we pumped using 394.38 and looked at the emission around 404 nanometer. For lift laser, we used a tunable titanium sulfur laser, 
and its frequency doubled to somewhere around this spectral region, then we scan approximately 30 gigahertz. This, this plot shows the difference between the lips as well as leaf. So the top one, in this case, we switched off the leaf laser. That means the entire emission is due to lips or thermal excitation. You can see the lines are really broadened here. With the times, lines are getting narrower and narrower because start broadening is getting lesser and lesser. And when you turn on the left laser, then you can see the persistence is going up like crazy. And in fact, we put a two microsecond gate to it for recording this one. You know, it persists for more than 300 microseconds. You had to increase the, you know, the gate to it for accommodating the reduction in the intensity. So LIF is basically providing sensitivity as well as boosting the intensity of the th emission. Okay? Now the question is, how can we get the highest resolution? So we developed a new technique. It's called, it's named a two-dimensional fluorescent spectroscopy. So what we did, we tuned across this transition and we record the emission using a spectrograph. And this is the two-dimensional uh, fluorescent spectroscopy image from a aluminum plasma. So here you can see that these are the lip, lip, lip emission and these are the lips emission, which is practically nil, right? So what's the advantage? So in this plot, you know, basically I'm giving the uranium as an example. You, we resonantly excited a, a uranium transition here and looking at the emission around a 4 of 4 nanometer. There are a couple of transition of potassium here, but we use the COPS glass that contain 1% 1 plus, 1 uranium. There are other, other elements like uh, potassium, sodium, calcium, everything is there, okay? Uh, that, that's the reason why you are seeing a couple of potassium transition. This is LIPS emission, and this is the LIPS emission. So if you are taking the vertical slice, vertical slice along this line, that gives the emission spectrum, right? And that's given here. And if you are taking the horizontal uh, slice along the excitation uh, wavelength, you will get the uh, lift spectrum. And you can feel the difference. The maximum resolution available from this spectra is limited to 45 picometer. That's a limitation, of, that is an instrumental resolution of our spectrograph. However, if you look at the uh, you know, lift spectrum, we got it around less than one picometer. That is the inherent line width of the transition within the plasma. Okay, so that's the advantage with the left. We are basically bringing high sensitivity and a high spectral resolution. And again, the average isotopic splitting of uranium is around 7 picometers. So using this technique, we can measure most of the uranium species in the plasma. We looked at the, you know, the effect of ambient pressure as expected, you know, if we have... If you increase the ambient pressure, what, what's going to happen? You know, the collision process will go up. The spectral broadening will go up. However, it's marginal. So when we increase the pressure from uh, pressure from uh, something like a 10 tau to atmospheric pressure, you can see that the the entire the half forward half maximum is increased up from approximately one picometer to 1.5 picometer. And we, we looked at the Gaussian and the Laurentian component. La Gaussian component means it uh, corresponds to Doppler width. And uh, Laurentian uh, means it's a Van der Waals, it's a pressure bonding. And in this case, you know, we, we are looking at very late times. That means Doppler is less or minimal. So that's the reason why we are se seeing the kind of flat here. However, the Van der Waals is going up, but still it's marginal. That's a good news because that means we can do live in atmospheric pressure conditions. So we performed an experiment with the, again with the uranium. That's, uh, uh, that's what we are interested. In this case, you know, we use two different samples with the extremes. Natural uranium, again, it contains 99.3% U238, U238, and then around 0.7% U235. In the other case, we use highly enriched uranium. It's approximately 96, 97% U235. And the experimental data are here. Uh, again, instead of using titanium sulfur laser, we use the uh, ECDF, that is external cavity dial laser with the 
It's Jeremy's laser. Uh, with a 5 milliwatt. We don't need very high power for doing this experiment. So we did some modeling. So this is the hyperfine structure of uh, U-235. So if you get a, you know, if you split it, so you will see this kind of splitting using uh, lift. So these are the, uh, the lift enhanced or lift enhanced lift emission. You can see the preferential excitation of the serine transition in the plasma because we are, we are exciting 394.38 uh, nanometer, but we are, resonantly non, we are looking at the non-resonant transition, that is 404.28. So you can see the significant enhancement in this, uh, in this transition. You can also see uh, another little bit of emission here because we notice that this upper level of this transition is very close to this one. So it's kind of collisional exchange, anything transfer, I could say. So these are the uh, these are the results. Uh, you can see that it's well resolved. Uh, this is with the natural uranium. Uh, it contains a small fraction of U-235. It's only 0.7 percent. It's very sensitive. Still, you can see that. In the case of HEU, it's almost kind of 98 percent or 99 percent of uh, uranium-235. Still, you can see that, and these spectra are well resolved. So here we showed that you know, even with a transition with a four picometer isotopic splitting, we were able to you know show decent spectra or good isotopic splitting with the lift. So lift is going to work with a standard application. That's what we are trying to prove it. Yeah, let me summarize it. Optical spectroscopy of laser ablation poems, it's a rapid stand of non-contact isotopic analysis. That uh, lips can be used it if you have a very big spectrograph and if you select a transition with the highest isotopic splitting, still it will work. Uh, we need to overcome all the limitation of broadening, etc. Uh, laser absorption spectroscopy it provides a high selectivity, sensitivity, spectral resolution, but it's a narrow band detection because basically, you know, using a tunable laser, we can tune only in the certain, you know, spectral window. Uh, that means most of the time we can get a one transition. We can overcome this transition using the frequency comps. We can get a broad spectral, spectral band uh, with a high resolution as well as sensitivity, sensitivity using the frequency, frequency comp. We developed a, a method called a two-dimensional fluorescence spectroscopy, which is providing the simultaneous absorption and emission. And we also demonstrated standoff isotopic analysis of uranium using 2D efforts. This slide gives uh, some of the you know, information for the students. If any of you are interested in uh, undergraduates are interested in you know, participating in the research program at uh, uh, DOE labs, there are programs. So it's called SULI. SULI is called uh, the Science Undergraduate Laboratory Internship Program. Yeah. Every summer I used to recruit like three to four people in the uh, lab. Because my collaboration with the Purdue, I moved from university to national lab, so I still encourage you know, students to come over there. Uh, dead, deadline is very close, October 2. That's good because still you have time. Uh, but if you're applying and if you're interested, please let me know. Otherwise, uh, you know, you can submit the application, then contact me, okay? Uh, similarly, there are some programs for the graduate students, too. If you want to do a part of the thesis in a, in a national lab, there are fellowships. You can apply. Again, if you apply there, you should contact us. The, I mean, the whoever you want to work with. This is very important. And finally, there are some postdoc opportunities with our group, too. So if you're interested, let me know. I think that's the last slide, and uh, I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Hi. Uh, so what was the target that you were using for this uh, U-235 